The NTSB has released the preliminary report on the Hoppajet Bombardier Challenger 600 jet that crashed on the freeway just short of the runway in Naples, Florida here earlier this month. It looks like they're beginning to focus on the possibility of contaminated fuel. Let's check it out. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. It's the 1st of March. The other possibility, which has not been ruled out yet, is the possibility of an inadvertent engine shutdown. More on that later. So this accident happened back on February 9th. I'm sure everybody's seen the video by now of the accident and see my initial update on that crash. The two pilots were killed and miraculously the three people in the back of the airplane survived. More on that in a minute. The airplane was returning to Naples Municipal Airport, Florida from Ohio State University Airport, Columbus, Ohio, where they'd flown to earlier in the day, so it was a round trip, and the airplane was serviced with 350 gallons of fuel at Ohio State before departure. So the aircraft had plenty of fuel, and if you've seen the videos, I'm sure, uh, that have been revealed from the trucker that captured the aircraft as it was landing on the freeway. The moment it impacted, the right wing impacted the sound barrier wall of the freeway there, that initial pop of white mist, that's jet fuel, which immediately ignited. Preliminary ADSB data revealed that the flight crew contacted the tower while on a right downwind leg approach to the airport and maneuvering for a five mile final approach to runway 23. At 15.08, the tower controller cleared the flight to land. The airplane was about 6.5 miles north of the airport, about 2,000 feet geometric altitude and 166 knots ground speed as it turned for the base leg of the traffic pattern. There was no problems indicated by the crew up to this point in the flight. A preliminary review of the data recovered from the airplane's flight data recorder revealed that the first of three master warnings were recorded at 1509.33, so just a minute and a half later, and they were the left engine oil pressure, the second immediately followed, well, one second later, right engine oil pressure, and at 1509.40, engine. The system alerted pilots with illumination of a master warning light on the glare shield and corresponding red message on the crew alerting system page in a triple chime advisory engine oil. Now, according to Challenger pilots, these are the first indications you get when you shut the engines off or when the engines fail. And for both engines to fail simultaneously like this within a second of each other really narrows down the choices of possible things that could have happened here. So if we go back and look at the track log here on FlightAware, at 15.08, the aircraft was cleared to land. So on this data, they're showing 1,775 feet, but they're in level flight, heading 096 degrees, and then uh, do the left turn to 053 degrees. And then at 0930 is when they get the warnings from the flight data recorder. And right there is where the rate of descent begins. They just begin a slight descent and then the rate of descent, descent continues and impact is not very long after. From an altitude of about 1800 feet and a descent rate of 12 to 1500 feet per minute, they've only got about a minute, a little over a minute, a minute and a half to get it on the ground. And if we look at the overhead view, somewhere along in here at 1,800 feet, heading eastbound, they get cleared to land. They do a little jink to the left to start their right base entry. And right about in here, it appears, is where the engines fail. Right in the short right base entry for the runway. So at 1509.33 and 34, they get the oil pressure lights. Now this is an indication of the engines failing and then getting the lights. This is not a case of them losing oil pressure and then the engines quitting. 20 seconds later at 1510.05 at about 1,000 feet and 122 knots on a shallow intercept angle for the final approach course, the crew announced lost both engines emergency, making an emergency landing. And so they 
master warnings begin right here at the right base entry and then they make the radio call right about here the tower controller acknowledged the call and cleared the airplane to land at 15 10 12 at about 900 feet and 115 knots the crew replied we're cleared to land but we're not going to make the runway we've lost both engines and that's when they make the bid for the freeway dash cam video submitted to the ntsb captured the final seconds of the flight and i'm sure you've all seen that video captured by the trucker and i can't replay that video here because that's what gets me demonetized here on youtube but it shows the airplane descended into camera view with a shallow left turn and then leveled its wings before it touched down aligned with the traffic traveling on the southbound lanes of interstate 75. The left main landing gear touched down first in the center lane of the three lanes and then the right main gear touched down in the right lane. The airplane continued through the breakdown lane and into the grass shoulder area before impacting a concrete sound barrier. And the aircraft was obscured by dust, fire, smoke, and debris until that video ends. So they had a little bit of uh, angle off to the freeway. They flew the aircraft all the way into the accident scene as absolutely best they could. They perfectly merged with the traffic, but they had just this slight amount of drift into this sound wall here that, that took them into the sound wall and spun the aircraft around. And in that video, you'll notice that when the right wing tip impacts that wall, you'll see that white spray that's the indication of fuel, which immediately ignited. There was plenty of fuel on board this aircraft. They did not run out of fuel. After the airplane came to a rest, the cabin attendant, an absolute hero in this story, just saved the two passengers' lives, stated that she identified that the cabin and emergency exits were blocked by fire and coordinated the successful egress of her passengers and herself through the baggage compartment door in the tail section of the airplane. Smart move. Let's check that out. The normal exit or en entry to these aircraft is what I would refer to as the one left door, the big door right behind the cockpit with the stairs. But of course, this door was blocked due to the accident and post-crash fire. So instead, the cabin attendant had to use this little baggage door located under here, underneath the number one engine. Now, there's a good video of how this door operates. Let's check it out. This is how to open the cargo baggage door from the inside. So you lift the cover, you push the button, the handle will move or outside, and then you just have to turn the lever. And slide up and out of the way. Why it's so important to know where all your emergency exits are and how to operate them. Great job by the cabin attendant saving the lives of the two passengers. The two pilots were current and qualified and well experienced for the operation. The captain had 10,525 hours total time and 2,808 hours in the accident airplane make and model. Very well experienced in this jet. The first officer, ATP rated with over 24,000 hours, makes me think maybe he was a retired airline pilot, but only 138 hours in the accident aircraft make and model. And we don't know who was the pilot flying at the time of the accident from this report? The airframe was a 2004 model with 9,763 hours total time on the airframe. Here's a picture showing where the left main touched down over here. They were, again, flying that aircraft as far as they could into the accident site, just merging perfectly with the traffic. But they had that slight drift into that wall. The right wing contacted the wall and erupted in flames and the aircraft spun around 180 degrees uh, when it finally came to a rest. And here's the aircraft spun around 180 degrees. There's the damage to the right wing tip from where it impacted the wall. They found the configuration of the aircraft to be with the landing gear down and the flaps at 45. A lot of post-crash fire damage. About 16 ounces of liquid with an odor and appearance consistent with Jet A fuel was drained from the aft tail fuel tank see previous uh, video where we went through the fuel system on this aircraft the sample contained about one half ounce of what appeared to be water the auxiliary power unit fuel filter bowl was removed for visual inspection of the fuel and the fuel filter no debris was noted in the drained fuel and the filter appeared to be clean the fuel was retained for further analysis now i don't quite understand how this paragraph is written this way but 
The engines and the respective pylons were cut from the airplane to facilitate recovery. A fuel sample was collected from the number one engine main supply when the line was cut. Okay, they got a little sample from the number one engine. However, no fuel was released when the number two engine main supply line was cut. All right, so they didn't get any fuel from the number two engine main supply, but they did get a little bit of fuel from the number one engine main supply. So was this just because of the accident that there was no fuel left in the number two engine main supply? Or um, could this possibly lend to the theory that the engines were inadvertently shut down and then possibly the throttles returned to an idle condition. The number one engine all looked good. There was no damage to the engine prior to impact. The main fuel control, throttle lever, spindle, lever arm, push rod, push pull rod were connected to the throttle linkage bell crank and appeared undamaged. The red alignment marks on the throttle lever, spindle, and lever arm were consistent with an idle throttle position. So from the engines, they were able to determine that the throttles were in the idle position or above idle position. They were not in the idle cutoff position. The fuel filter appeared clean and no evidence of debris or foreign material was observed within the fuel filter pleats. Fuel samples were collected from points throughout the fuel system. All samples appeared clear and consistent in odor with Jet A. The fuel flow transmitter was removed and examination of the inlet and outlet ports revealed them to be unobstructed. Examination of the fuel injector, injectors revealed normal operating signatures and one of the fuel igniters was removed and displayed no anomalies. Visual examination of the main fuel control unit, this is still the number one engine. The main fuel pump and the main fuel inlet port revealed no anomalies. The oil filter appeared to be in good condition and no particles were observed within the pleats. The right engine had thermal damage from the post-crash fire, but otherwise the turbine blades all appeared to be in good shape inside of the aircraft. The main fuel control unit throttle lever and throttle linkage bell crank was observed in a position consistent with being forward of the idle stop. So again, it was either idle or above it. They were not found in the cutoff position at the, at the crash site. The core cowl doors were removed to facilitate examination. No evidence of case uncontainment was observed. There was, the, the engine did not have a uncontained blade failure before the accident. The fuel filter bowl displayed evidence of thermal discoloration. The filter appeared clean with no debris or foreign material within the pleats. Fuel samples were collected from various points throughout the fuel system. The fuel from the filter bowl and heat exchanger displayed a yellowish tint, while other fuel samples were clear. The odor of the samples were consistent with Jet A. Samples collected from the main fuel control and main fuel pump exhibited small black debris, but that was likely introduced during the removal of the components. Examination of the fuel injectors revealed normal operating signatures. One of the two fuel igniters was removed and exhibited no anomalies. Visual examination of the main fuel control and main fuel pump revealed no anomalies. The main fuel inlet port exhibited a small yellow colored debris particle. The oil filter appeared to be in good condition and no particles were observed within the pleats. The main fuel control and main fuel pumps from both engines, fuel injectors from both engines, and all collected fuel samples were retained for further examination. Both engines were also retained for additional examination. So they're going to look very closely to see if this fuel was contaminated or not. Fuel contamination definitely could be a factor here. Remember the fuel system on the Challenger all feeds into these two collector tanks before heading out to the engines. But the fact that both of these engines shut down almost simultaneously within a half a second of each other really leads to some additional questions. Most jets that I fly, the Boeing and Airbus airliner type aircraft have two separate fuel control switches that you got to lift up and over in order to shut them off. They are not associated with the throttle quadrant. They're behind the throttle quadrant. On the Challenger jet, we've got max power, idle power. Now remember the uh, investigators so far found that out at the engines, the they found the linkage to be at the idle or just above idle position out at the engines. But below the idle position is the shutoff position. That's how you shut the engines off. But in order to get to the shutoff position, you have to raise 
these two latches. So there's a solid gate there that, that prevents you from moving the throttles to a shutoff condition. But if you raise these two latches, you can get that. That's how you shut the uh, engines off. Here's a picture of the center section of the Challenger jet. The flaps located over here. The thrust levers located right here. And the um, idle shutoff release levers, the two red levers located right down here. So if you've got uh, the pilot in the right seat flying the aircraft, hand on the yoke and left hand on the thrust levers, doing a right base entry and the pilot operating the flaps, the pilot in the left seat operating the flaps for the pilot flying in the right seat, the pilot in the left seat may reach around behind the thrust levers and reach for the flaps. Now, if you are retarding the throttle, if you've got the, the clearance to land, it's kind of a short approach. You're going to turn 90 degrees and come on in and bring the throttles right back to idle. If the pilot in the right seat has his right hand behind those thrust levers and is reaching for the flaps, and at the same time, the uh, pilot in the right seat retards those thrust levers, it's possible that the pilot's the left seat pilot's arm can release these idle shutoff red levers, raise them up enough. And if the pilot in the right seat is looking to the right and bringing those thrust levers back to idle, he could slide, he could potentially slide those thrust levers right into the shutoff position. Once the engines are moved into the shutoff position, there's no quick relighting those, those engines. And the first indications that you're going to get of an engine shutdown are those oil pressure warning lights. There's an older service bu bulletin on the uh, Challenger 600 series of aircraft dated back uh, in 2006. So it's more than likely that this service bulletin has long been complied with, but it does bring up the possibility of this situation. When the throttle is at the uh, climber cruise position, the teeth inside the throttle gearbox can wear. And if the teeth wear too much, this can cause the throttle to jam or move out of position misrigged. If there's a misrigged condition, the movement of the throttle towards idle can corresponds to a position close to fuel shutoff. This can cause the engine to stop. It is not possible to restart the engine when this situation occurs in correct idle position. So was it fuel contaminations or were both engines inadvertently shut down by the crew and then the throttles brought back up to an idle condition? Or is there something else that we have yet to see in this accident investigation that possibly could have caused this dual engine failure? It'll take the NTSB about a year and a half to two years to come up with the final report. The next step in this will be a release of the public docket, which will take probably a year and a half. And that'll be all of the data that the NTSB has has to offer from this accident investigation. Then shortly after they release the public docket, they'll come up with their probable cause of this dual engine failure. Thank you so much for your support of this channel, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here.